Nature Solutionaries is a podcast about conservationists who do amazing things for nature and bring inspiration into our lives. In this podcast, I usually interview people about their wildlife conservation projects, but over time, I've noticed that whenever I ask conservationists about why the animals and ecosystems they try to protect are threatened, they always mention that humans put an immense pressure on the environment. And so I thought, why not talk about the impact of the growing population on nature and about possible solutions? For that reason, I invited Terry Spar. Terry is a filmmaker, environmental activist, and the executive director of Earth Overshoot, a nonprofit that raises awareness about our unsustainable growth in population and consumption. In 2019, he produced 8 Billion Angels, a documentary film which exposes overpopulation as the upstream cause of all our environmental problems. Together, we are going to talk about earth overshoot, overpopulation and overconsumption and solutions to these problems. Terry, I'm wondering how you became interested in overpopulation, overconsumption and overshoot because um, it's not a usual topic that many people talk about. Uh, I, I'm... 55 years old and uh, over my lifetime I've seen these you know changes they happen gradually but when you you know uh, you know sit back and look at them uh, they're very real and they're happening from a you know an evolutionary perspective or a ge- you know a, a geological perspective very quickly and they're happening instantaneously these changes and uh, they're obviously negative uh, in many ways from you know what we're doing to the earth and so you know, I, I realized that all these symptoms that we're seeing of, uh, you know, planetary health that was getting worse, you know, there there had to be some sort of, you know, uh, reason for that that was, uh, you know, what is that upstream cause? And I, and I really started asking a lot of questions and saying, you know, why is this happening? Why are we seeing more plastics? Why are we seeing, you know, the tides rising? Why are we seeing, you know, extinction of species and, and uh, all the toxification of the waters and the land and the air? And, uh, you know, and everything that we've been trying to do to sort of slow down or, or reverse these, you know, negative impacts on the environment, you know, everything was getting worse. There are, you know, there are a few uh, examples of where they've gotten better, like the, the bald eagle and, and some other species that we've, you know, put significant efforts to conserve. But by and large, every, uh, you know, uh, biosphere is uh, getting worse, not better. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, we've got to be able to change our way of thinking. And unless we do, unless we, if we don't do that, you know, uh, we'll keep repeating the same things and we'll keep getting worse off. So I think, you know, these crises, these crises we're seeing, uh, you know, are solvable and, uh, but we have to address some of the issues that uh, we haven't been willing to, to, you know, open that door and discuss and, and, and let out of the closet. So can you explain to the listeners what overshoot, overconsumption and overpopulation are? That's a great question, and uh, it, I think it's on our website on the front page. There, it, it's uh, it, you know what is sustainability, and you know the definition for sustainability is for the you know ability for a species to survive in perpetuity, you know, basically forever without you know depleting its resources nor damaging the environment in which it lives. And uh, we're not doing that, and uh, you know we're basically depleting. Our resources, like um, fish stocks and soils, and uh, meaning healthy soils through erosion and, and their fertility, uh, our freshwater reserves, uh, our plants and our trees, and, and we're you know generating more waste uh, across our land and in our waterways and you know in, in our air that can be assimilated naturally. So you know we're drastically altering the ecosystems, and they're getting worse, not better, and we're not going to be able to survive much longer. So we're essentially overshooting those resources because there are too many of us consuming too much. So there are two things that we can do, Veronica. We can either try and reduce our consumption or we can try and reduce our overall numbers, our population, and we can do both. And, uh, you know, that's what our organization, you know, really does is help people understand and educate them about the whole picture and not be afraid to discuss the population issue, which most environmental organizations uh, 
uh, just uh, have an instinctive inversion, aversion to stay away from. Why do you think that so few people talk about overshoot or overpopulation? That's a, a it's 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 a tricky uh, conversation. It's a difficult conversation, uh, and I think it's uh, it, it's it's it goes back uh, you know historically to you know all kinds of you know issues that are you know whether it's uh, human rights abuses, um, reproductive autonomy. Uh, political, cultural, economic, you know, religious. Uh, so it spans all these, what I would say are minefields. And uh, it's not an easy conversation for people to have. But, uh, you know, if you, and, that, and that's the purpose of, of the film, and it's the purpose of the, the, the nonprofit is to help people, you know, be able to uh, digest it better, to understand it better, and to be able to you know, communicate that better to other people so they can find a voice and find strength in this uh, issue because it's very real and we need to have an honest and open conversation about it and be able to talk about it without having, you know, the fear of a blowback from, you know, others who aren't as informed. As an environmentalist, uh, what do you think about the obsession with climate change? I'm saying obsession because I, I do think it's obsession because there are so many other um uh, topics or, or problems that we can talk about. For example, in 1992, there was a conference in Rio de Janeiro and there were two tre uh, three treaties signed. One was about climate change, another one was about biodiversity loss, and the third one was about desertification. And it's like, I wrote my master's thesis about desertification and it's as if this topic didn't exist at all. Everybody just talks about um, climate change. And for example, I remember that I was doing this um, research after finishing, um, after graduating from university, where I made a list of so many NGOs and think tanks. And oh, it was back in 2016. And very few of them had a category or a tab about climate change. And now when I check them after five years, almost all of them are talking about climate change or include it as one of their topics, but none, none of them talk about desertification or very few about biodiversity loss. So why is there just such an obsession with climate change only? It's easier for people to focus on climate change because uh, there's fear around that. There's fear of the unknown. We don't know how it's going to unfold. You know, we, we think things are getting warmer, that there are more fires, that there are storms. But, uh, you know, it's not, I guess it's, it's, it's very hard to define, you know, it's a lot easier to define when you cut down a forest and you develop housing. Uh, you know, that's not scary. It's not hard to see. It's not hard to understand, but it has a major impact and it has even maybe even a greater impact than climate change in some ways, especially if you're doing a lot of it across the globe. So I guess climate change to me, it can create fear because of the unknown and how will it impact me? And I just don't know that. Uh, and I think everybody else sort of feels that fear. But um, I think uh, the solutions are another thing as far as being offered to fix climate change. They're typically technological. Uh, and I think any kind of solution that uh, deals with technology offers hope. It also offers buy-in because, you know, there are businesses that are around it that people can profit from it. So I, you know, I get that and I get that's why it gets focused on. Um, and, you know, people want a, a, a vision of the future that's cheery and it doesn't require sacrifice. And, you know, if I can have a technological fix to something, that's a lot easier than saying, oh, I need to reduce my consumption or I need to reduce the number of children I'm having or offspring I'm having because that's having a dramatic impact on the climate. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the truth is we, you know, we do have a human impact crisis that you know, no amount of technology, you know, will be able to get us out of. You made a very interesting point with saying that whereas we can try to fix climate change with te technological solutions, we can only fix overpopulation and overconsumption with our sacrifice. And that's a difficult talk and maybe people don't want to do it, right? It's difficult. Exactly. Um, the, you know, we as a species uh, don't want to face up to things that are true and unpleasant, and we'd rather embrace things that are easy, that are uh, oftentimes not uh, the best path, but they're 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 more palatable to 
to uh, you know, uh, you know, emotionally accept. Uh, and I think sometimes sacrifice is not the best thing, but it uh, it's it it is the best thing. I, I think uh, if we want to advance, we have to go through pain to advance and, and be healthier in life. And then the same thing goes with our you know looking at the environment and how best to fix it. And so, do you think that there is a chance that people will uh, sacrifice, even if it's unpleasant for them? Like a majority of people? That's a good question. I guess uh, we 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 make changes in our lives based on uh, you know uh, uh, hope, but also pain, and you know going away from things we don't like and going towards things that we do like. And uh, you know, I, I think as things do get worse in the environment. Uh, Uh, because of you know what we're doing to it that you know uh, people who have been on the fence about it will you know become more active and more proactive and saying you know we need to do everything and we need to give every uh, solution a chance and not only do we need to do alternative energy but we you know need to educate women you know not only do we need to do organic farming but we need to uh, provide universal access to you know modern day contraception uh, so I think uh, we're no longer, you know, uh, we can't sit back and just say we, you know, need to fix climate change. We need to put everything on the table, including those things that will help us, uh, what I would say, grow smaller gracefully. According to the UN World Population Prospects, the human population is growing by 1 billion people every 12 years. That's, we are adding 80 million people to the planet every year. And while some countries have stopped growing and even decline in their populations, the total fertility rate continues to be above replacement level. Replacement level, it's two, number two. And globally, um, now we are at 2.3 births, births per woman, with an average of 4.8 births per woman in sub-Saharan Africa and above four births per woman in other countries such as Afghanistan, Yemen, or Timor-Leste. It's estimated that in 2050 there will be between 9.4 and 10 billion people in 2050 and between 9.4 and 12.7 billion people in 2100. In spite of these statistics, many people deny that overpopulation is a problem. So uh, why do you think that people deny overpopulation I, again, I think there are a, a, a number of reasons that um, uh, you know get to the core of how they feel, even though it may not be logical, whether it's again religious or cultural uh, or political or just the fear of uh, that conversation. But uh, it's very real, and those numbers you you know quoted are astounding. And in the film, the bioethicist even says, you know, certainly eight billion, which is where we're just about to be in the next year or two, is not sustainable. And certainly nine and ten, eleven billion are not going to be sustainable, or twelve billion. It's just, it's it's crazy, and uh, we'll continue to see the you know general erosion of our natural resources. We'll continue to see conflict. Uh, over scarce resources, it'll go, it'll grow worse uh, with more people because each of us, no matter, you know, certainly in a, in a developed world, we consume a heck of a lot more uh, compared to a developing uh, world uh, citizen. But you know, each of us does need food. We do need clothes. We do need shelter. Um, we need fresh water. And, you know, uh, as, as you probably did with your studies, with your master's, uh, desertification and, and degradation of land is, you know, happening in some areas where people have a, a subsidence life. They don't live on much at all, but they're still experiencing the impacts of overpopulation. And these countries that are really in serious trouble, they're recognizing it now. They're seeing it now, and it's becoming a much more acceptable conversation to have. It's true. I, I actually read uh, an article in a newspaper called New Telegraph. It's from Nigeria. And um, a few a few public health officials uh, recognize the rapid growth of Nigeria as a big problem because um, the people will not the people will not have enough food to eat enough good uh, drinking water also not enough employment so so one thing that that shocks me <laughs> is that whenever you 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 start talking about overpopulation people People think that you hate people. 
you know, but it's not true at all because it's actually you want to provide good um, life standard for the people who are on the planet. But the more that there are of us on the planet, the the lower standard everyone will have, you know, and it will be even worse for people in uh, the countries like Nigeria or some sub-Saharan countries where desertification is a huge problem, where where the land is being degraded. So there will be more famines there, you know? Right. It's- you know, uh, I, I would think the, the people who are espousing and, and advocating uh, who I, you know, work with are, you know, have their hearts in the right place. They, they love people. And just as you said, they, they, you know, they want everyone to have a good and healthy and prosperous future. Uh, but when they're, uh, you know, when we're adding 80 million people a year to the planet who all need, you know, just basic uh, resources to survive, and that uh, impacts what else is available for everybody else, it, it, it does create um, uh, hardship. It does create uh, you know, uh, 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 sacrifices and, uh, and, and, uh, consequences that are you know, negative to both human health and also to the environment. So yes, uh, I do care deeply, not only for the environment, but deeply for human health and, and the future of my children. In your film, Bill Ryerson, founder and president of Population Media Center and president of the Population Institute said that Many economists have convinced politicians that more people are necessary to keep economic growth going. More consumers, more workers, more taxes. So um, can can we get out of this scheme, you know, that's so ingrained in people? It's very tough because uh, the, the media out there and even economists that don't understand the natural world, they, you know, they regurgitate, they, they spit out the same thing over and over again. They don't think critically. And, uh, you know, that, that the, the, the narrative that they, uh, you know, foster and continue is just, it's misguided. And uh, we need people to, you know, uh, to think critically and, and write about, you know, the truth. I, I, it's just the, the belief that uh, economic growth will, you know, uh, die if we have a declining population is just not, it's baseless. It's just not accurate. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, your country is a great example of a, a population that's fairly stable and has been stable for a while because of, you know, uh, below birth replacement uh, uh, fertility rates. And, you know, just the fa- past five years have been, you know, a good economy. Your, your, you know, the Czech Republic's GDP has gone from 16,000 to about 20,000 euros. Uh, the you know, annual growth rate has averaged about three and a half percent. And, you know, there are many countries that are actually in declining populations and all their economies are doing well. Japan, you know, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Croatia, Romania, Poland, uh, Portugal, and uh, they're doing fine. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think What's incredible too is, you know, not only are they doing fine economically, but uh, you know, the 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 climate and the environment is actually being restored. There's uh, I've been reading studies in Japan where, uh, you know, uh, houses are going back to nature because there are not enough people to live in all the homes that were there because they have a declining population. So uh, it's uh, you know, there's a, a restoration uh, of nature, which is you know uh, I think a good balancing act for and uh, you know a country that may be. Uh, you know, overshooting its resources. I watched this uh, show. It's called uh, Global 3000 or Global 3000. Um, it's produced by Deutsche Welle. It's about globalization. So I love it because mostly they don't talk about Europe and the US, but all the rest of the world. And so it's very interesting for me. They talk about conservation projects and development um, initiatives. And there was this one episode where in the beginning they talked about Uh, the fires in California and obviously the climate change and how it's bad. And then there was another um, part of the show where they talked about declining population of China and how that is a bad thing. So many people in the media, they just, they think that whenever the population is going down, it's a huge problem and suddenly they have to, you know, start increasing it again. And again, just this baseless. And, and what's ironic about you know some of these uh, you know citations about climate change is you, you mentioned the fires in California. Um, you know, it, there's been so much 
news about that and how it's related to climate change. But, you know, what's fascinating isn't, and I'm sure there's some climate change uh, uh, as part of that, but what's fascinating is if you actually go back and you look at uh, fire records in, in history, uh, back in the 1930s and 40s, over a period of two decades, uh, there were three times as many fires uh, in our country here in the United States and five times as much land that was burned on an annual basis, if you average it, than there is today. Mm -hmm. The difference is that back in the 1930s and 40s, we had about one seventh as many people. So you have seven times more people, uh, you know, all over the West, all over California, uh, seven times as many households, seven times as many businesses and stores that are obviously encroaching in these areas that used to be able to burn without, you know, taking any sort of impact to, you know, uh, you know, uh, our, our civilization and, and, and the people who have built in those areas. And now it's a real problem. So uh, no one mentions that it's an issue of, you know, population growth. They just mentioned that it's climate change. And, and there is some truth to that. There may be some climate change involved, but it really is about, you know, the, the fact that we just, you know, uh, have just multiplied throughout that area that was normally free and clear of any sort of human life. That's interesting. It is. It's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, people, but the news doesn't like to report those things. They don't dig deep into understanding the impacts of this population growth and, and uh, how it's, you know, putting us in, in, uh, in more jeopardy when we're getting closer and closer to, you know, uh, riverbanks that overflow or, or, or areas that are prone to fires. I have another quote um, that's relevant to our discussion. It's from Martin Luther King. I don't think that anyone would expect that Martin Luther King uh, talked about overpopulation, but in fact he did. So in 1966, Martin Luther King said that unlike plagues of the dark ages or contemporary diseases, we do not yet understand the modern plague of overpopulation is soluble by means we have discovered and with resources we possess. What is lacking is not sufficient knowledge of the solution, but universal consciousness of the gravity of the problem and education of the billions who are its victims. So now we are getting to the second part of the interview. First one was talking about the problem and another one solutions. So in my view, one of the solutions is for people to acknowledge that overpopulation and overshoot is a problem. So how can you make people realize that it is a problem and that they should talk about it? I think it's uh, twofold. Obviously, there's you know the, the facts and the figures and the logic, Veronica, but I think you also have to appeal to people's emotions. And uh, certainly our, our film uh, tries to do that with the stories that we have in it and uh, the The, the people who are everyday people who are struggling with the, you know, the impacts of, you know, the polluted rivers in India or the polluted air or the, uh, the, the you know, their wells run dry in the Midwest of the United States or uh, the fisheries are, are basically you know, decimated in Japan. So, you know, we do, you, you do see that. And I think that emotional connection is very important uh, because people are moved by emotions, not by logic, but, Uh, they do have to also, uh, you know, uh, hear the logic in, in the conversation as well. So uh, I think it's also important is how does it impact me? I mean, you or me or anybody else as an individual. And uh, I think once people start to connect the fact that this population growth impacts them with, for example, high housing costs, when you have a lot of people in a dense area, you know, costs of living go up. So high housing costs, you have, you know, overcrowded schools, um, You know, you, uh, here in this country now, we've got, you know, to go out to see nature and to, you, you have to have a campsite, uh, you know, reservation system and, and, and even lotteries. So, you know, it's just, it's just incredible how hard it is to be able to even go out to some of these natural places. Um, we see it with like beach closures from pollution runoff. So loss of green space. So, you know, all these things, when people can associate them, begin to see that, you know, our growth in our numbers is impacting them personally. You know, uh, in the in our country now, we're starting to see uh, restrictions in water use uh, in, in the West. And now they're saying it's because of climate change, but really it's because there's so many people that are just consuming too much water for agriculture and for their own personal use that they're going to start to say, geez, we need to look at this from a bigger picture about the fact that we do have too many people. And uh, 
I, so I do think it's going to change as, as hardships, uh, uh, you know, get greater for, for people, you know, all over the world. But what if people don't feel the impact so much? For example, I come from the Czech Republic. And I mean, if you live in a small town or in a city, you don't feel the overpopulate. You, you don't think that overpopulation is a problem because we don't have so many people. We are 10 million people, as you said below fertility rate people have enough food they have enough water the weather isn't extreme here so um i don't think that many people would view it as a problem and i don't think that they can make connection so much yeah so maybe you uh, i think that's the, the interesting thing i think you have to appeal to what's important to those individuals you know it's there's no one solution for everyone with anything in life and so You know, for someone who comes from that background, as you just said, maybe the appeal is that, hey, if you have one fewer child, it's a significantly less cost to you and you'll be able to save more and you'll be able to have a, a, a more, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know to retire earlier or you'll you know, be less stressed. And there, there are uh, different ways to, to look at the value. It might be somebody who's in, you know, who, uh, who doesn't see the issue, but they do love the environment and they do are through education realize that, you um, Yeah, you know, they can uh, have an impact, or maybe they understand that the environment's getting worse, and that if they bring a child into the world, uh, is that the right thing to do when you know the 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 world's not heading in a good direction? So, I, I think there are different ways to to appeal to people and help them understand uh, this you know you know critical issue. So, a study from Lund University from 2017 uh, concluded that the four actions that most sust- substantially decrease An individual's carbon footprint are having smaller families, living car-free, avoiding air travel, and eating a plant-based diet. How much impact does having one child have on the planet? And we can speak both um, in Europe and in other parts of the world. Or you're in the U.S., so <laughs> maybe you can. Yeah, and that's a good distinction. So, you know, that one child born to a, a in a developed world like the U.S., you know, will have a, a far greater impact, uh, both with, you know, uh, carbon emissions, you know, CO2 into the atmosphere, and also any, all the, all the other, you know, uh, resources that, that that child will use over their entire lifetime, far more than maybe some child from, you know, Bangladesh or Africa, where it might be the equivalent of 70 or 50 children. So, uh, you know, it, it certainly where that child is born is important as far as their impact on the environment. Uh, but if you look at that study, they, they take a developed world, you know, uh, like a U.S. citizen, they say, like, uh, you know, having one less child, uh, it's just it, it's an enormously profound um, uh, impact uh, that you will have on the environment as far as uh, they just do it with emissions. That's their study is based on CO2. And uh, it's, for example, it's 264 times more powerful to have one less child than it is to recycle your trash over your entire lifetime. Um, it's 72 times more powerful than going vegan. Uh, and it's 24 times more powerful than driving a car. So, you know, uh, it's incredible that, you know, when you think about having a child, it's, you don't think about it, but you know, think about it, all the food and the diapers and the paper and the, uh, you know, just the, the water and the resources and the metals and the minerals and, you know, plants and everything else that that person's going to consume over their life. Most women don't think so logically about having children. They just think like, oh, it's so cute to have a baby, <laughs> including me. I mean, even though I'm so much interested in overpopulation and in raising awar- awareness about this issue, when I think of myself or other girls or women, I, I, I don't think that even even though they love the environment i think that they're more prone to you know going to a zero uh zero waste store to buy groceries or uh, using bikes instead of cars you know or public transport but whenever it it comes to you know having children people feel like it's my personal choice nobody nobody should tell me what to do you're absolutely right And uh, I, I can totally understand and appreciate that because when my wife and I had our kids 20 some years ago, 
the the thought never crossed my mind about what the impact of a child does have on the on the world, the, the environment. And I wish I had had you know this education uh, in high school and college, and you know through your podcast. It, I wish someone had, you know, helped me understand this back when, before I had children, because I, I think, I, I know I would have been much more thoughtful uh, of, uh, you know, uh, and, and deliberate as far as you know, the number of children I would have brought into the world. And how many children do you have? I have three. Okay. <laughs> and do you feel bad about it or what? Uh, I, I don't feel bad about it. I, I wish I had known more about this before we had children. I, I had no idea. And, you know, I think, you know, everything does start at home. And uh, the, with my children, I uh, certainly have encouraged my own children to consider having smaller families. Uh, ultimately, it's their decision. Uh, but I, th I think they do have to. And they, they're very aware just because of you know, my activities over the past five years. Uh, they're very aware of the you know the emergencies that we're seeing that we're seeing across the globe with the climate, with you know water scarcity, with food, with pollution, with energy and, and extinctions. And so you know they understand that you know in order to get that under control, you know we we do need to all do our part, and, and part of that is uh, consider having smaller families. So they know that. Uh, again, it's their choice. Just I think it is everybody's choice, but I, I think it's important to be informed and. I just wish I, you know, had had that same information and knowledge back when I was a child growing up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what are small families to you? Uh, it could be anything from uh, having no actual children and having a dog. Very common thing in the Czech Republic. Just before <laughs> chill, just before people get kids, most of them have dogs. <laughs> and uh, nothing wrong with considering that your family. Uh, I, I've spoken to other couples that have no children and they consider their family, their, uh, their nephews and nieces. They consider it, you know, I talked to a couple who feel they've had an incredibly close relationship with each other's parents, uh, more so than their siblings have had because their siblings are so busy raising their, their own children. So they found value in, in, in being around their parents as they aged. They found, you know, value in their nephews and nieces and, and, so I, I guess family is what you want to make it. It doesn't mean that you have to have a child to have a family, in my opinion. And uh, again, the, the numbers are, are where you feel comfortable. I think uh, if you understand the consequences of having a child and what it does as far as imposing the, you know, the impacts uh, on the planet uh, from having that child and also bringing a child into a world which, uh, in, in my opinion, is not heading down a healthy path right now. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly would uh, myself be very concerned about having more than one child. One concern with this, in case people decide not to have children consciously, not because they can't, but is that there is this pressure from grandparents. I don't know if it's the same in, in the US or whether it's just here, but whenever people are across a certain age, they get asked this question so often that it's it's almost bugging them like, oh, when are you going to have kids? And why don't you have kids? So it's it's still somehow quite unacceptable for people not to have kids. And it this it's 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 interesting, Veronica. That that is an experience that's you know, uh, felt in many, many cultures, and there are other cultures where uh, it's expected that you, you, that the family have a large family, that it's, you know, you have five or six kids, or uh, there are a lot of, and this was brought up in the film, there are a lot of countries where patriarchy is a, a major cultural issue, where uh, the man uh, controls more, you know, the size of the family. And it's just, it's just wrong. Uh, you know, we need to let people uh, have you know, their own freedom and decide, determining the, the, the number and the spacing of the children. I think uh, what uh, is critical about the film, and as you heard, it's uh, one of, uh, you know, A, changing social norms so that, and the bioethicist said that, I think you recall that, where he said, you know, we don't, we shouldn't be asking people, when are you going to have children? That should be, you know, something that is an intimate decision between, you know, that individual and or partnership about when and how many children, we shouldn't be asking them that. And, we, uh, but we should also, you know, be able to provide, uh, you know, a safe place for them to determine in the number of children, the spacing. And that means giving, you know, uh, people the access to modern contraception and empowering women to allow them to make those decisions themselves. And 
very important. And I think there, there are social uh, you know, issues there that are, are uh, as important or more important than uh, it is as far as the environment. These are just you know, human rights. From my experience, I'm a mother of two children and it's almost unacceptable to have no children. And it's strange when you have just one because people keep asking you, like, when are you going to have another one? And now that we are, we have two kids, people are asking, are you going to have a third one? And if we had a third one, then people would keep uh, start asking us, are you going to have a fourth one? I, I don't know. It's, it's uh, a personal I, I, choice. Wouldn't it wouldn't be and, funny if uh, the, the, the social norms changed so dramatically that people would be like, why are you having kids? <laughs> don't you know the consequences to the environment? Wouldn't that be uh, uh, interesting? Uh, but you're right. That's uh, that's that's certainly a, a, that's how it uh, happens here in the United States as far as you know the social pressures uh, and, then, and when's the next one? When's the next one? And you know, uh, as opposed to hey, uh, you know, having one child is uh, you know a symbol to me that our uh, small families a symbol of parents who you know really care about the climate and about the environment and the well-being of future generations. You also mentioned the importance of contraception, and I agree with that fully. That all women should have access to family planning methods so that they can choose when they want to have children or whether they don't want to have children. But unfortunately, there are 232 million women who, especially in world's developing countries, who don't have access to these methods. What are your suggestions? You know, I, there are you know, close to 200 countries out there and, and every country is different. Um, But uh, that's why I think a lot of this has to be organic from the ground up where people say, you know, we need to, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, reproductive, better reproductive health or, you know, better uh, women's rights in our country or, or gender equality. You know, these are uh, important and they're and they're vitally important in their own right. And as a matter of, you know, public health and social justice. Um, so I think that's critical, and each country is different uh, how they manage that and how they uh, you know, uh, define that. And but that that has to be something that you know, the voice has to be strong amongst the people in order to make sure that there's that change at the higher levels of, of, of you know the legal systems and, and cultural systems. And uh, you know I think what's beautiful is when you have you know that right sort of uh, recipe of, of of access to you know reproductive uh, health, and you have. Uh, women who are empowered or in the workforce, um, you know, I think an outcome from that is uh, that you you do see a reduction in total fertility, and you eventually do see a slowing of population growth, which uh, you know will ensure a sustainable future for everybody and for you know future generations. Would you know any examples of countries or places that are doing uh, better um, in terms of slowing down the growing population? It, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of our projects that we'll have by the end of the year, we're, we're coming out with a sustainable uh, population map, and it takes really good data of, of countries. And it looks at there's a, an organization out there called the Global Footprint Network, mm -hmm. and they look at a country's uh, footprint, you know, the, the amount of economic activity and consumption and the number of people. And is the country, does the country have enough resources to You know, manage that uh, you know consumption and activity from you know its population, and is the country actually you know declining in its resources, or does it have a reserve, an ecological reserve, or is there a deficit? And so we're we're taking that stuff and we're we're actually creating a map and uh, to sort of allow people to look at their individual country and see whether they're improving or getting worse when it comes to sustainability. And you know, I, I think. Um, uh, There are a lot of countries, and it just some of it's just happening by uh, just progress. But whenever you see, uh, you know, improvements in the economy, you tend to see uh, a, a decline in fertility. So we're seeing as a general global trend, the fertility rates are coming down across the globe, more or less. Um, and that a lot of that's just a, a guess, economic improvement, access to all those things like healthcare and, and uh, reproductive healthcare and contraception and, and education. So uh, it's happening. Uh, almost naturally in many ways, but there are countries that in the past have absolutely um, sped up that uh, uh, that 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 uh, um, uh, path uh, towards uh, uh, you know uh, reducing their fertility, and they've done it uh, through intentional campaigns. They've 
you know, uh, been much more vocal about uh, and, and providing that access and, and, and creating a, 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 a culture and a, an understanding among their people that, you know, it's important to, you know, grow smaller gracefully. Right now, uh, for example, Egypt is in this process of dealing with this because there are over 100 million people. They're, you know, highly unsustainable. They just can't keep up with the uh, healthcare and education and infrastructure and uh, water scarcity is a major issue. So, uh, the the you know president there uh, El Sisi has is is doing everything he can to help people understand that unsustainable population growth is a, a, a clear and eminent imminent danger to you know its its country and the society as a whole. But there are many countries that are doing well or that did well. For example, Iran is um, Iran did well, Bangladesh and um, Thailand. Thailand, yeah, that's there's a number of them. Uh, Mauritius, uh, Maldives, uh, there Ethiopia. That was in the film as well. So uh, yeah, there there are a lot of countries that when they you know have intentional campaigns, uh, all in a human rights context, all uh, non coercive, all voluntary, uh, they've uh, had remarkable results in in improving you know uh, both the you know the health of the overall populace and for individuals. Uh, but uh, you know, it 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 it's, you know, improves their living conditions, improves their uh, financial security, and, and, and you know, it, it empowers women. Uh, all these all these you know wonderful social improvements uh, from governments that actually focus on this issue. Before we wrap up, I would still like to ask you a little bit about uh, the consumerism, you know, the overconsumption, because that's also another important topic or equally important. So. Um, Besides having a small family, individuals can also have a less consumerist lifestyle. And I read on your website that for 7.8 billion people to live sustainably on the planet, everyone would have to live in one room apartment with minimal electricity, no central heating, heat or hot water, no washing machine, dryer or dishwasher, only a few sets of clothes and pairs of shoes. And such a person would also have to be a vegetarian, never drive a car, and never fly an airplane. But no one, no one wants to do that, right? Everyone wants to have a better lifestyle than this. So what can we do? Isn't that incredible? I mean, that that yeah. if we're gonna live, if we're gonna live equitably, that's what uh, a sustainable lifestyle would be for almost eight billion people. And you know, that's based on uh, assessments. I've, I've uh, spoken with a lot of economists, uh, you know, environmental scientists, ecologists, and, you know, reviewed a whole bunch of these assessments. Like I mentioned, the Global Footprint Network, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and they all pretty much concur that we need to reduce our overall economic activity for our consumption by about 50% globally. And so when you average that out among 8 billion people, that what you just described is what a, a lifestyle would look like if we're going to do this equitably. So you're right. I mean, there are three and a half billion people, more or less, who are living above that lifestyle you just described. So how are you going to get those uh, you know, three and a half plus billion people who live in all these different countries, different cultures, different you know, political backgrounds, different you know, uh, you know, beliefs? to, you know, uh, simultaneously and immediately, you know, reduce their standards of living by anywhere from 50 to 90 percent. It's just not realistic. Throw out all the washing machines and no heating, even though it's minus 10 outside. No central heating, right? You basically have to, you know, you know use, a, use a little electric stove or something to heat. It's, 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 a, it's, it's just not realistic to think that. And the other big challenge that people don't understand is it's very difficult to reduce our overall consumption. And what I mean by that is, you know, you or I could do a specific task, like I could stop driving a car, which is really good, but because it's going to save a lot of resources, you're not using all the metals and, and minerals and, and, and uh, you know, uh, fuel and energy that's used to create that car and also operate that car. So it's a, it's a significant environmental savings. But oftentimes people in the environmental world and very smart people just look at that in a silo. They look at that as an individual action. And yes, I'm doing good for the environment. And you are for that specific task, but that doesn't operate by itself. When I do something like that, where I reduce a, 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 a consumptive activity like driving a car, I also have a savings from that. There's a financial savings to any kind of reduction in consumption. And for a car in America, it's about $6,000 a year. So I no longer have that car 
and I am doing a good thing for the environment, but now I have $6,000. So I'm going to go to Hawaii. <laughs> so I'm going to go to Hawaii or to <laughs> Europe, or I'm going to buy more electronics, or I'm going to, you know, uh, buy, uh, move into a larger home. So, you know, the hard part is realizing that, you know, when we do save resources or save something from an activity that we no longer do, we reduce our consumption. There is a corresponding financial benefit that we get that invariably goes back into the economy in some other way. So it's very difficult to reduce our overall consumption because we, you know, I think just we don't think about it, but we actually end up you know, shifting it to some other, you know, activity. So do you think that it's realistic somehow to to reduce the consumption without shifting it somewhere else? Uh, not voluntarily. It's I think it's almost impossible. You literally have to either if I if I gave up driving a car and the six thousand dollars in savings I'd have annually from not driving a car, I'd literally have to essentially rip that money up. I'd have to tear it up. I have to get it out of the economic system. Because otherwise, it's going back in and it's buying more materials, buying more energy, causing more damage to the environment. So you literally have to destroy that 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 wealth. The only other thing you can really do is you can take that money and you can buy land and conserve land. Uh, so you think about it. If I buy land and I conserve it, I've taken that money out of the economic system. It's no longer going to be buying, again, minerals and metals and biomass and all the things that are going to damage the environment. So it's very difficult to reduce our consumption. We literally have to destroy our wealth. And that's not an easy thing. I never thought about it this way until I read it on the website. Honestly, you know, I, the, I think that there is also this trend of minimalism, you know, and people feel good because they have less stuff. But as you're saying, even though they, they buy less stuff, maybe they go for better holidays or, or, They unknowingly do that. They think they're, you know, living minimalistly, but are they? And that's the question. Maybe some of them are. Maybe some of them are taking that money and they're buying land and, and getting it out of the system, or they're giving it to organizations like us who are helping to provide, you know, education or provide contraception or provide, you know, education for girls in, in countries that are not educating girls. So, uh, you know, maybe they are doing that, which is a good, you know, use of those dollars. But in most cases, you're right. They're unknowingly shifting it to other consumption and other economic activity. And it's not really uh, changing, you know, uh, their lifestyle dramatically enough to, to make a difference. So in your view, is it worth talking about reducing the consumption? I think it absolutely is. If you can truly do that and, and any dollars that you save, you, you know, use it towards things that are really going to, you know, help, uh, you know, reduce our overall impact uh, on the on the planet. So yes, I think you can. Like like for example, I uh, you know I, I put all LED lights in my in my house and my electric bill is now $50 less a month. So I have $600 more a year. What's important is I don't take that $600 and go out and buy a, an iPhone or a laptop or more clothes. It's it's I take that money and I give it to organizations that will reduce our overall footprint, which means, you know, the, the things that we're doing. Uh, it's 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 reducing our numbers. That's going to be critical. And one final question I have for you uh, is what things do you do to live sustainably? You know, I do try and do things like uh, plant uh, trees and I, I, I do, uh, you know, uh, try and buy my food locally uh, so that there's, you know, less, uh, you know, fossil energy going into transporting that food. I try and buy organic food. Um, I, I do try and, uh, you know, politically influence uh, my, you know, uh, political leadership to help them understand this issue of uh, overshoot and educating my friends and families on the dangers of unsustainable population growth. Um, with nature, I, I'm, I'm constantly out trying to be in nature. I'm constantly trying to help restore nature. I, I pick up trash. I, you know, will plant trees for organizations. I'll, you know, try and protect watersheds. Uh, I, I think uh, there are things that we can do to clean up and improve nature, uh, which I think is important. Uh, but the The most sensible thing, certainly, to uh, you know, reduce our our impact on the planet is to you know, and I spend a lot of this time is educating people on the impacts of uh, the population. Terry, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. For more information about Eight Billion Angels and Earth Overshoot, go to the website eightbillionangels.org or earthovershoot.org and check their social media. 
Thanks a lot for listening. If you'd like to hear more episodes like these, subscribe to Nature Solutionaries podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. See you next time.